So welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast with the legend, you know, Tim Vickery, who is out in Rio, but with me, Dotson Alibaba, who is in, in an even more stifling London, I, I'm presuming, this afternoon, Tim, than you are. Yeah, and, uh, and Tommy may, may well want to um, edit this bit out, but as Miles Davis would probably have said, it's colder than 10 motherfuckers here at the moment. <laughs> 15 degrees when I went out to get a coffee. I want my money back. What for the coffee or for the or for the climate? <laughs> I'll, I'll take it all. <laughs> yeah, our guest. We should introduce him at this point. Oh, Sid we are Lowe, on. We uh, really are on. Journalist based in a hot, I'm presuming, Spain as well at the moment, Sid. Yeah, I'd like to claim that, but I'm in London, so I'm entirely in agreement with you because I've I've had to come back. I'm doing quarantine at my parents' house at the moment. Um, so if you can see the various bits of memorabilia about Thatcher finally being forced out of the British government behind me, <laughs> that's my, the, my, it's my dad's doing, not my own, much as I'd like to claim credit for it. Um, and you're right, it's unbelievably hot. I think I'm hotter. It's definitely stickier here than I was in Madrid. It's hotter than July. Oh, yeah. it's as hot as July, actually. <laughs> Let me correct Stevie one. Yeah, July. <laughs> it's a bit like saying enough is enough, isn't it? And obviously enough is enough because it's the same word. Yeah. How could enough not be enough? Well, it's the same Bloody thing. stupid and phrase. I'm sorry, you've given me the opportunity to bring in some Swedish into this immediately. The equivalent in Sweden is lagom. So you go around and, you know, you go to a canteen and they say, how much do you want? You say, oh, lagom. They say, right, okay. <laughs> now piss off. <laughs> no complaints. You ask for lagom. It can be big or it can be little. It can be somewhere in between, but it's never enough. So we are talking, as we always do on a Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, about an iconic football match. And this one is a cracker. I've got to say lots of goals in it as well. Going back to 1960, the 18th of May 1960, uh, the European Cup final, as it was then known, Champions League nowadays, of course. Uh, but this was the European Cup final, which Real Madrid always win at this point. They always win it. And they're playing against Eintracht Frankfurt, who have just stuffed Rangers in a really uh, enjoyable semi-final. 12-4 on aggregate. Mad. Absolutely mad. Well, this game ain't going to disappoint in terms of goals because there's bags of it as well. Well, isn't uh, it wonderful how the Scottish crowd, as this game was at Hampden Park, how they turned out for it and how, how they, they, they reacted. But just to, to get the ball rolling, you mentioned Real Madrid always won it. They were the only team who had won it. At this point, this was the fifth of five. And if we can just roll the ball, the ball back with uh, El Señor Baja, another five years, to when the European Cup starts, is there a notion that Real Madrid are going to become Real Madrid? Or are they just Real Madrid? And when the thing starts, do people know what's, what's, what's ahead of them? No, they don't. They definitely don't. Um, it's the beginning of something moving, definitely. Uh, you look at you look at the arrival of, of Alfredo Di Stefano and it changes everything. He comes in 1953, so it's just in time, if you like, for this kind of dynasty to, to be built. Real Madrid, put bluntly, when Di Stefano arrives, are not that good. You know, they're a big club. They're a significant club. They're, they're obviously in the Spanish capital. They've, they've got financial muscle, but they're not the club that they're going to become. And there's no guarantee at all that they will. I mean, to, to give you a stat that probably st stands out nicely, Real Madrid won five European Cups in a row. In those five seasons, they only won two Spanish League titles. So they're not even the best team in Spain while they're being the best team in Europe. And I suppose there's a parallel with this recent Real Madrid team that won, of course, uh, four of these in five seasons. At a time when domestically, at least, I think most people in Spain would say, well, Barcelona were the better side. There's a lovely quote, and it's from Puskas, who's talking about the Barcelona team. And the fact, of course, that that Barcelona team had, had Hungarians in it who were colleagues of his. And he said that team... While we were winning everything in Europe, they were winning everything domestically. Now, that's not entirely true. Barcelona themselves only won two of the five league titles when Real Madrid were winning the European Cup. But he, he writes in, 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 in his book, Pushkas, he says, they seem to be able to do us any time they wanted. And the Hungarian lads would phone me up and take the piss out of me. And yet at the same time, this is a Real Madrid team that's going on winning five mm -hmm. European Cups in a row. Could you argue then that that, European, so that Real Madrid team was a team that was engineered, if you like, to, to win the international tournaments, the European Cups, rather than focus on doing the domestic. You know, it's this argument that you, you find particularly foreign coaches always having to defend their aspirations for a Champions League 
title nowadays rather than going for winning the Premier League, for example, here in the UK? Yeah, I mean, obviously, look, it's different to now because the, the length of the Champions League is, is not so significant. The number of games you play is, is not so significant. Obviously, clubs don't have huge squads as well. Um, you know, it's three games, well, six games, three rounds to get to get towards the final in, in Real Madrid's case, I think, in, in, in this 59-60 season. Um, I don't think there would be a sense that they were set up necessarily to win knockout round, uh, not a knockout competition. I think maybe you could look at it more from the point of view of the structure of the competition. So, for example... A lot of Barcelona players of that era will say we were the best team in Spain. But in this whole run of five European Cups that Real Madrid win, Barcelona only get the chance to face them once. They only get the chance to play against them once, which is in this year. And then the following year, they win it. They beat, they beat Real Madrid and, and they get through to, the, uh, through to the, the final, which eventually they lose to Benfica, I think, if I, if I'm, if I remember wrongly. Uh, and so I think it's partly about the structure. Um, you look at the, the title winners, and I wrote them down here because I was kind of struck by it. So you've got Athletic, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Barcelona, Barcelona. So you've got three different teams winning it in that era. You've come off the back of a period when Sevilla have won it, I think the year before or two years before that little run. Um, and so I, th- I think it's about who you face as much as anything else. And by the way, this is also an argument that gets expressed even now. You know, this, this recent Real Madrid run, but lots of Barcelona fans will tell you, Now I'm not saying I agree with them, but it's worth telling you what their argument is. Yeah, that Real Madrid team got lucky because we kept on getting cleared from their path by other people, most notably, of course, Atletico Madrid. There's One thing another... I think is really striking about the five-year run, and maybe, maybe very modern about it, is the constant renovation. Mm. And when I think of a football back in those days, I remember like Bill Shankly turning up for a, go- for a Liverpool game somewhere and, and someone asked him what the, what the team was. And he said, aye, because he always said that. Yeah. Same as last year. You know, and, <laughs> but with Real Madrid, in the course of the, the five, there's like four different coaches mm. and there's a constant renovation of players. They keep bringing in, and which, which seems to me to be years and years ahead of its time. And it's also, and th- this I, th- I find surprising, given that it's Franco Spain, that is just, it's like being stuck in a fridge, isn't it? In some ways, the world is going on. on just think what's happening in Italy in the 50s with the Marshall Plan money. You know, you, I, I've, I've got a recent obsession with 1950s Italian cinema and just see how, you can see how richer they get during the course, you know. Well, you can see the, it the, from the, your, the, your outfit as well, the way you dress today. You've got an obsession with 50s Italian films. Uh, yeah, I do, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you ain't going to drag me out of my dream period. No, I'm, I'm staying there. Uh, and, and meanwhile, you know, Spain and Portugal, I think Portugal are cutting the education budget every year because ignorance is the price of social peace, you know. And, and Spain's in this Franco deep freeze. But it's such a cosmopolitan side. It's you know, they, they bring in they bring in yeah. copper from Spain for yeah. a while from from France for a while and they, they've, they've got Argent, Argentines anyway they're bringing Pushkus yeah. from, from from Hungary Santa Maria from from Uruguay there's this constant renovation and on this game that we're talking about the the Eintracht Frankfurt side are all German yeah whereas the Real Madrid side is cosmopolitan and that that strikes me as str- the, both the, the the constant renovation is strikingly modern. And the cosmopolitan aspect seems out of out of kilter with what what Spain was at that time. There's, there, there are a whole load of sort of different ele- ways of picking up on this, and 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 I, I'm kind of mindful of not going off on a massive tangent and, and having to. Come That's to, what you're here uh, for. Yeah, I know, and, and never having never finding my way back again. But let, let's try and start with a, with two elements of that. Number one, let's start the purely the footballing side of it, which is, and and I think obviously we see this with. Florentino Perez, the current Real Madrid president, and what is, I think, uh, a do you do that? Do you do that Perez thing? Yeah, sorry, I don't mean. It's funny, you know. It's weird that the, the Spanish tangent. game, the Span- Yeah, here, here this is a massive tangent. But let's <laughs> let's go for it because you've asked for this now. Yeah, right? exactly. the, the, those Spanish names that you learn before you go to Spain, you still say in an English way. The Spanish names that you've learned being in Spain, you say in a Spanish way. So for me, it's still Barcelona. It's not Barcelona. But it is Zaragoza. It's not Zaragoza. <laughs> and and, and there, there, isn't a lo- there isn't a reason except where I learned to say that word. How much jit you get, do you get for this? Because uh, I get untold jit yeah, for this from, from the English. Bit. I think people think you're taking the piss or trying to be a smart ass, don't they? They, yeah. think, they think you're trying too hard. Uh, and, and actually, it's not that. Because as I say, I'll still say Barcelona and I'll still say Valencia. I won't say Valencia. 
Um, but yeah, Saragossa comes out as Saragossa. And so much so, for example, I see the word racing in English now and I read rapping. <laughs> It's not from, from, from roughing something there. I read, you know, it's, there's, there's the roughing at Haydock today, the 240, um, lucky lad one. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, that, we, you see, look, we've got on the tangents already. So, so that Spanish team, um, I was mentioning Florentino Pérez, wasn't I? That's why we got to that point. Yeah. The Florentino, I think there's a deep-seated desire to emulate and surpass Santiago Bernabéu. And I think one of those things is this idea of the Galacticos, which isn't just about getting the best player in. It's about, if at all possible, getting the best player in every year. So you look at what Florentino Perez did, which was, of course, the signing of Figo, followed by Zidane, followed by Ronaldo, followed by Beckham, followed by, and you can hear the needle scratch at this stage, Michael Owen, right? But you've, so you've got every year you add one of these players. Now, Michael Owen did come with a Ballon d'Or, and I, I don't think you know, should, we should necessarily dismiss him because of that. And this is really an idea from, from, from Bernabeu. So Bernabeu gets Di Stefano. But he gets Copper, he gets Pushkas, he gets Didi, he gets uh, Luis del Sol. These, these players are constantly coming in. Some of them which don't work, by the way. And Didi certainly didn't work at Real Madrid. Copper comes in having just defeated him in the final of the European Cup. And this guy is amazing. The one player on the pitch who's possibly better than the Real Madrid players gets brought in. And so it is the, yeah, this idea of constant renovation. To put that in its social context, and, and, and like you, I, I, I like the social side of it. And, and I... I'm possibly aware of, of the risk of overstating this, but 1953 changes everything in Spanish social and political history. Three things happen. A Concordat gets signed with Rome. Spain basically gets brought back into the Western world because of the United Nations and, and so on. And Di Stefano arrives. And I really do think those three things have huge social impact. And so you say that this is kind of a, a, a Franco Spain that isn't looking beyond the border, but it, that, that, that thawing out, is starting to happen and of course that really accelerates through the 60s uh, because you get an opening up of the border you because you get uh, the end of an autarkic economic policy because you get the beginning of, of tourism which is what really drives spain's um kind of social shift in the 70s and sorry in the 60s and into the 70s so i think you're getting the start of that and then of course you're also if you look at these individual players you've got argentinians and uruguayans well in a spanish sense that feels like culturally the same thing you get it's Pushkas, who comes from a communist country, so it's a great propaganda victory as well. You know, bringing naturalizing a, a, a someone from a, a communist country who then talks about the, if you like, the beauty of living Spain and Spain's so different from the from the Eastern Bloc. And so you you can kind of see, if you like, the cheat codes that allow you to do these things that don't necessarily fit with a lot of the way that the the the, the country is still set up. It's it's hard at the best of times to try and sort of find a social context for a football team. But when you talk about one player in particular, in the way that you talk about Di Stefano, and particularly a player coming from another country, another continent, I got the context of uh, the, perhaps for us, it would be the comparison with having Scottish players or Irish players or whatever it will be in uh, the English leagues. But nevertheless, he is a foreigner. H how can you justify the suggestion that he is part of a triumvirate of shift in Spain and Spanish people. Right. Well, I mean, all sorts of things happen with, with Di Stefano. And, and, you know, we really could be here four or five hours talking about the transfer and the fact that that became a, a battle between Barcelona and Real Madrid and the involvement of the Spanish government in that, the involvement of the Spanish Football Federation, which was very definitely an arm of the government and FIFA's involvement and so on in it as well. Um, and so that that's part of it. When when that whole thing reaches a stalemate, famously, of course, the Spanish government took the decision to say, right, no more foreign players. And both Barcelona and Real Madrid kind of lobbied against this because at this stage they both think they've got a chance of getting him. So they open, they effectively open and allow Di Stefano to come in before banning foreign players. And then and there's and that late that ban runs all the way through till the arrival of Johan Cruyff in 1973, I think it is. So it's, I think it's the best part of 12, 13 years without, or more without being able to sign foreign players. And the reason why I say it changes things is because I think it, it helps to project a different view of uh, Spain and Real Madrid. I think Real Madrid's successes in Europe have a social significance beyond a purely footballing one. I think we have to be very careful with suggestions that Real Madrid, if you like, are the, the standard bearer of the Francoist regime, because I think that's a step too far. But there is a famous quote from one of the Francoist foreign ministers saying that Real Madrid is the best embassy we ever had. Now, that's not quite the same as saying they're going around Europe 
and, and extolling the virtues of Franco himself or his political system or, or the nature of the country. But it is about projecting the idea of Spain as a modern state and also, by the way, accelerating that process to some extent. And so I think you have these processes that are going on in parallel of, of an economic liberalization, of a political liberalization, of a repackaging of a regime as, if you like, a Cold War ally to the West rather than, rather than the last vestige of, of, of fascism against which, of course, the West fought in the Second World War. So you get this sh these shifting, I don't know what to call them, really, I suppose these shifting tectonic plates, if you like, in terms of how you understand what Spain is. And the success of Real Madrid becomes part of that, if you like, repackaging of what Spain is internationally. Now, nationally, of course, whether that has that impact is, 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 is problematic, but it is all part, I think, of this kind of, of a, what you might call a, a modernization process. Now, there are all sorts of caveats here, and there are all sorts of areas in which this argument doesn't entirely stand up, but there's definitely a, a role to be played by football in terms of social shift. Well, I've, I've long thought that he's the most influential footballer in the history of the game. I think you're right. Um, both on, because you imagine the European Cup starting, 10 years after the Second World War, and they're still rationing in England for crying out loud, you know, and there's still lots of all these enmities are, are still, they're still there. They're still very, very present. And the European Cup could have failed, couldn't it? It could have, absolutely. And yeah. because of the glamour of Real Madrid, you know, Leeds wear white. You know, that, 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 it, it's, it, they were an extraordinary, glamorous thing. And they were De Stefano's team, weren't they? When you mentioned the failure of the Brazilian midfielder, Gigi, who went there after the, after the 58 World Cup, great player. But he couldn't be in the same team as, as De Stefano because De Stefano is, is only nominally in the WM. He's a centre forward. He, but he, he's coming, he just orchestrates everything. And one of the things I find really striking watching them is, in a football sense, how compact they are, meaning that, 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 that there's always proximity so it's always possible to play two or three little, little, little passes. You particularly unless they're, unless they're breaking Hento on the counter. You particularly see that in this game, in the goal that Di Stefano scores from the edge of the area. The little exchange in the middle of midfield as that move starts to unfold is a great example of that. But he has to be the yeah. centre. Yes. So Gigi would, would, would wanted to be the centre as well. So that, 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 that doesn't work. For me, one of the genius things about this team is Pushkas getting that. I ain't going to be the... I'm, I don't have to be the main man here. I can I can be a brilliant part of the supporting cast. And it's that realisation from Pushkas that makes this team. I think there's a big part of that. And I think if you read Pushkas's memoirs and if you talk to those players, because obviously Pushkas died too early for, for me to have ever spoken to him, but talk to some of his teammates about him, there's a, there's a real fondness for Pushkas. And there's a real sense of his awareness that, as you say, that he didn't need to be a superstar. And by the way, we're saying he didn't need to be a superstar. He scores four goals in this game, <laughs> right? This is the guy that's, this is the supporting cast who scores more than Di Stefano. And he tells an absolutely brilliant story about the end of this match. And, and actually, if you look at the clip of it, you see it at the very, very end of the highlight. I know what you're going to say, because I wanted to bring this up, actually. Okay. Is it, is it... Wait, or should we do it now? I mean, well, no, no, no. Then, yeah, let's do it now. But it, my question is, is the German player asking for his shirt or the football? No, he's asking for the ball. So, so what happens is that, that, that Pushkas admits that he and Alfredo Stefano, when games were won in the final few minutes of games, would sort of knock the ball around and, and sort of try and hope to be on the ball when the whistle went to be able to keep the ball. And Pushkas even makes the point that, you know, we both got hat tricks, so we're both worthy of the ball. But I got one more than him, so I figure this is mine to, to be had. But I just need to be on the ball when it happens, because otherwise there's no way I'm getting this ball off Alfredo, because I know that he's going to want it. And what happens is the final whistle goes, and as I say, you can see it in the, in the footage of this. I think it's the footage. There's, a, there's kind of a three or four minute highlights package, which Real Madrid TV did, and it's just at the very end of it. And you see him, he gets the ball and he puts it under his arm and someone hugs him. And I must confess, I, I can't now remember which player it is. And he's holding the ball under his arm. And Steen, who, of course, has scored two, I think it is, or has he even got a hat-trick? I think he's got two for, for Eintracht, comes over and asks for the ball. And you actually see Pushkus kind of waggle his finger at him and say, no way, mate. But he admits it in his book that he later on decided, actually, you know what? This poor guy's lost. He's been a brilliant player. The least I can do is give him the ball. So he does give him the ball, which obviously in itself is very nice. And I remember talking to Pepe Santa Maria about this, who was the, the central defender, and he was saying, well, yeah, it's easy to be nice when you've just won. Uh, it's slightly harder to be nice when you haven't. But I think what it really tells you is about that Di Stefano Pushkas thing. And we 
have lo- there are loads of examples of that. There's examples, for example, of of Pushka saying that the Stefano would get absolutely well, should we use a very Scottish phrase, get really raggy whenever he lost a game of cards, for example. He would be railing at everyone and shouting at everyone and calling everyone names. And that he basically learned to let him win. And that one year in the chase for the Pichichi Award for top scorer in Spain, they were both on, I, I mean, I can't remember the figure, but let's say for argument's sake, it was 22 each going into the last game of the season. And Pushkas makes the decision to lay one on a plate for Di Stefano because he thinks it's just not worth it. It's just not <laughs> worth this guy. And if you talk to teammates of of Di Stefano they will all tell you put bluntly that he was a bit of a bastard and, uh, and, uh, he, he, and uh, he comes across as such a sour grumpy yeah, figure that is fabulously grumpy I, I I think I mean I don't know this for sure I think I might be the last person to to have ever interviewed him certainly he was getting on a bit when I spoke to him and he but he was so much fun in his grumpiness you know it was glorious <laughs> it was it was you know it was it was kind it was of Walter it was, Mattel absolutely it was it was it was absolutely brilliant and yet at the same time there was a sort of a fondness there there was a kind of warmth there but he talked even then a lot about the money a lot about the pressure that they were under a lot about that sense of you know, there's not a huge amount about the enjoyment but yet every now and again you get these little shafts of light and one of the ways of kind of expressing this thing we were talking about is the contrast between asking teammates about Di Stefano and they're all incredibly grateful to him because I think they're all aware this guy led us to be what we were and then ask them about Pushkas. And they might not be as grateful, but they're a lot warmer. And, they, they, you know, they, they, would, they, would, they would sort of talk about him with this real warmth. I remember speaking to Amancio Amado about him. And Amancio came a little bit later and was part of the team that won the European Cup in 66 when Real Madrid won the next one. And, and he, he said, I remember basically saying to him, so what about Pushkas? Because we've been talking about the Stefano for a bit. And he said, I feel like standing to my feet and just, just saluting just for you. you just mentioning the name. Pushkas was the best. And he said, Pushkas used to shout at me because he was fat and he was slow. And if you pass the ball two metres in front of him, he literally wouldn't move for it. He would say, that's no good. Put it on my foot. I'm not going for it. And he would we'll call give me you... the taxi fare. Exactly. He would call you every name under the sun. He said, and he said he could only play in five metres, but his five metres were golden. So we just let him. But he was just a comp- incredibly warm-hearted in a way that I think probably Di Stefano wasn't. And yet Di Stefano was the absolute business. I had a moment, one of the l- last interviews I did with, with members of that team was with um, Santi Stevan, who actually didn't play in the 60 final because he was injured and he was watching it from, a, from his hospital bed. But he, we'd done this long interview and we, we got up to leave the, the Bernabeu, the old Veterans Association, and we were getting ready to walk out and we were, we were heading towards the door. And bear in mind, at this stage, I'd done six or seven interviews with people who play with his Stefano, all of whom you could, you could feel that hint that he wasn't always that nice. You know, we absolutely loved him. He was brilliant, but he wasn't all that nice. And there's a moment where Santi Stefan says to me, obviously, the tape has stopped running at this time. We're walking out. He says, by the way, everything you've ever been told about Di Stefano, forget it. And I thought, oh, here we go. This is the player who's finally going to say to me, you know, really clearly, he was an absolute pain in the ass." And I said, what do you mean? Forget it. He said, no matter what they say, they can never tell you how good he was. You know, it, 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 he says, even if I stand here for an hour telling you how good he was, I still won't reach how good he was. So however much we eulogize him. And I thought, oh, that's slightly disappointing because obviously I wanted someone. <laughs> but at the same time, it was a brilliant encapsulation of, if you like, the admiration, even if not always necessarily the warmth. Yeah, you can see you can see how brilliant he is in this game, actually. And he's got an elegance about him, which contradicts the grumpiness almost because yeah. there is a... Uh, it, it's, it reminds me of when we played football in school and you scored a goal and you ran back to your half of the pitch with this sort of gate of, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to brag, but I am the greatest. You know? <laughs> He's got a little sense of that as in his you know, teammates come and congratulate him. Uh, Eintracht Frankfurt in comparison in, in this game they do look somewhat workmanlike, and yeah. I, I know it's slightly disrespectful given that they they got the first goal because uh, Real Madrid start off quite slow, don't they? And uh, Eintracht Frankfurt got a decent goal actually coming in from the right wing, etc. But I just couldn't get over the fact that their goalkeeper was wearing a flat cap. 
<laughs> yeah, okay. and it's just one of those things that you think were they here to to play football or were they here to just you know represent but they all wore flat caps I was going to say if you look at the crowd yeah. there's probably a hundred thousand flat caps in there yeah yeah but not goalkeepers I mean I know well, the, the, great, the great Zamora from Spain yeah, always yeah. wore a flat cap yeah. didn't yeah. I think it was Doesn't it was just right, part but didn't wait, even wait. didn't 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 as the you know listening to Kenneth Balls tonight makes me laugh because uh, the first game I ever watched was the seventy one FA Cup final. It was still it was the last one that he did, and Highway sold the dummy to Bob Wilson. I love those little pauses. <laughs> uh, Bob Wilson used to have a little cap, didn't he? Did he have a cap? I don't I, remember him wearing. I, a cap. I think caps were the thing. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure it's it's reason enough to dismiss a goalkeeper at this stage of no. of, of, of human uh, evolution and history. <laughs> But against, you know, the goal-scoring machine that is Real Madrid in this game, you know, the goalkeeper... He you think he should have thrown his, his cap at some of those well, shots? No, but you see yeah. him so many times shrugging his shoulders <laughs> every time Real Madrid scores. If, <laughs> look, what could I have done about that? I could have done with a little bit more defence, but, you know, what did you expect me to do? And with the flat cap on, it didn't look as if he was really <laughs> trying. I'm sure he was. Uh, but anyway, Eintracht Frankfurt, as I say, they, they get off at a galloping pace they probably know that they're in for a hard match don't they I thought yeah there's a there's a there is a sense in Spain at least I don't know if Eintracht Frankfurt themselves would have would have had had this I imagine not because looking at kind of press reports from the era there was an expectation that Real Madrid would win it which of course is natural given that they won four in a row but there was a sense in Spain that this Real Madrid team was getting old and it was coming to an end in fact when they play Barcelona in the semi-finals there's a belief that this time Barcelona will go through and it will be Barcelona that reach, reach the final not, not Real Madrid. And certainly Pepe Santa Maria always said that, that he felt that they needed that first Eintracht Frankfurt goal to kind of get them going. As if, you know, they were they sort of sauntered into the game. Maybe they didn't have the energy that they'd once had. And then it's like, oh, shit, hang on a minute. This lot can actually play a bit. And at that point, react. And then once they react, there's, there's, there's no response from, from Eintracht. I think there's one of the match reports, and I, I must confess, I can't remember which paper it was, um, there's a line, something like, uh, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but there's, there's something like Eintracht Frankfurt themselves probably didn't mind too much losing to a team this good. And you're right, there are moments in the footage where it sort of feels a bit like that. They'd say, ah, oh, well, it's all right, I'm on the same pitch as these guys. Well, there's a couple, of, if we break down the match into, let's say, three segments, Eintracht Frankfurt probably won the first 20 minutes. Uh, Real Madrid won the rest of that first half and the first maybe 30 minutes of the second half. And then, yeah, but by, by which time, and it, and it, it's all over at half time, isn't it? When Pushkas puts the third one in on the stroke of half time. But and then still, they just go berserk afterwards. Exactly. This is what I'm saying. It's all over at half time, but Real Madrid don't slacken off, do they? And Eintracht Frankfurt still managed to get two goals subsequently towards the end. I don't know what happened at that point because that kind of somewhat blots the copybook for the Real Madrid defence. But Real Madrid seemed to me to be a team that were that was an attacking team at this point and not that concerned about the defence so much. It's almost like that classic. Uh, Kevin or is that Keegan is that WM? Statement. Is that just yeah. a system that, that people played then? That, that it does, it can leave it very, very open. I think there's an element that I also think there is there is something about that Real Madrid team in terms of the mindset because it's one of the things that that has always struck me about about Di Stefano is is perhaps that 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 touch of a combination of Messi and Ronaldo if you're going to use a modern comparison. So you're talking about a centre forward that's not really a centre forward. Well, there's the Messi position for you, the guy that wants to be involved in everything that can do it all. But also there's a kind of relentlessness about him that, that's perhaps closer to Ronaldo. And, you know, you talk to, to players who play with him and they'll tell you that he would spend the whole game really in their ear. Oh, come on, really aggressively relentless. But that one of the things that obviously I think helps to reinforce the admiration is the idea that he would never demand from anyone else what he wouldn't give himself. So he would be going and going and going. And, and, and certainly he, when I spoke to him, and it's, obviously it's a very long time ago now, but I remember him saying something along the lines of, you know, we would go and go until the 75th minute. And if the game's won at that stage, maybe we start messing around. You know, maybe we start enjoying the last 15 minutes. And perhaps that's the explanation for exactly this pattern of scoring. Maybe that's part of it. That this, yes, this is an attacking team, but it's also a relentless one until they know it's done. And maybe that, you know, when you've got scored seven goals, even if you do concede two late on, then, then perhaps, perhaps that helps to explain that. Is this last one the greatest? 
Good question. And if it is the greatest, why did it drop off? Uh, I think it's the greatest. It's certainly the greatest in terms of how it's remembered, in terms of the quality of the performance, in terms of the way that the players themselves talk about it. Why did it drop off? I think may even be related to that. And I think maybe it's, it's related to that because maybe they think it's the greatest because it's the last one. So by definition, it feels like the culmination of everything. Maybe it drops off partly because actually it was always going to. They knew they were coming to the end. And I, I guess, you know, to use that horrible, uh, what would you call it? Cliche, simile, whatever. It's like climbing a mountain. Once you've reached the top, there is only one way you can go. That's not to say that you can't maybe win a couple of times on your way back down. Um, but I think, I think there was a sense that it was coming to that point anyway. Di Stefano was already aware in 1960 that Real Madrid had started looking at possibilities of players to replace him, even though it would take, I think, another three years for him to actually go. And he would go after they, after they lose the final in 63, I think it is. Didn't uh, he go off in a fabulous sulk? He went off in a massive sulk. Um, and of course, they, they lost to Elenio Herrera's team. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a massive sulk and a blaze of ill-fitting clothes. Very much, very much the way. He also, I mean, Di Stefano was, was quite quite stylish for his era and, and very famously in Spain because it caused a, you know, you go back to that social thing you were talking about earlier, caused a big stir that he advertised women's stockings uh, at one point, Di Stefano, and that caused a stir. And it wasn't even his legs. It was like, you know, those kids' books where you have like three, three bits, you've got the head and the body and the legs and you turn the pages over. So it was his picture on the top with ladies' legs stuck on the bottom as a picture. It was a Photoshop. It wasn't even his legs and stockings. Mm. And yet people still got upset about it. I suppose... Uh, That's Franco Spain for you. Well, that, well sure. yes, exactly. And this is the beginning of an opening up process that absolutely has not been completed yet. Yeah. I suppose um, when you said that when you get to the top of the mountain, where else is there to go? You find other ways of going up the mountain, you know, other challenges, yes. you know, you, you approach Everest from the south face or whatever it is, and there are always still some challenges to achieve uh, one way or another. But uh, the thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about Barcelona and Real Madrid and Barcelona being the more dominant domestically, there isn't a, a real um, pincer movement from... Spanish football on the world stage at this point. They're not able... So they dominate the European game. Yeah, they didn't it, make it to 54, did they? Uh, to 58. Oh, 58, oh, I think you're right. I think they're not there in 58. I think you're right, yeah. Well, why, how, how, can yeah. We, how can we explain how they Well, the league is so powerful. The international, European Wait. international tournaments, are they're so successful at but not on a sort of a world stage what happened there i i think that's a good question and it's one to which i i don't know if i can give you a an adequate or a convincing answer um i think when you look at these two teams Madrid and barcelona who are the strongest at this point you are looking at the best player in the really strong barcelona team just before di stefano turns up at, at real madrid is kubala who's hungarian although ends up nationalising. Di Stefano, who's Argentinian, again, ends up nationalising. Um, Luis Suarez, of course, wins the Ballon d'Or, having gone to Inter, but he's a Spaniard. Um, and and he's he's part of this, this Barcelona team at this point and goes to Inter with Elenio Herrera when Herrera leaves Barcelona. But in terms of the national team, it's difficult to judge. I mean, Elenio Herrera, for example, becomes the Spain manager in 59 while he's still the Barcelona manager. And it's been incredibly tense between Barcelona and Real Madrid, particularly under him. And he's very much a kind of an early version of Mourinho. It's deliberately provocative. It's deliberately trying to create division. It's trying to create confrontation between the two clubs. And actually, the Real Madrid players in that national team refuse to shake his hand when they turn up to the, to the squad get together and so on. In fact, to the extent that they're talking about possibly boycotting it. So I don't know if that perhaps plays a part. But then, but then I suppose we shouldn't go too far down this route because Spain win the European Championships in '64. Um, and admittedly, the European Championship then is, is a semi-final and a final, and they beat the Soviet Union, and that has all sorts of huge ideological um, connotations, and it's very significant. Um, so I don't know if, if we can if we can write this off as the kind of thing that happens in an era, by the way, in which obviously not that many teams make it to the World Cup anyway. You know, the, the great Hugh McIlvaney was there, uh, and he wrote a runner piece on it. So it's a, it's not it's not. A, considered piece it, it's it's one that's <laughs> that he's trying to keep pace with all the goals as as they're going in but there's there's some and it, interestingly he says that the crowd start off supporting the germans yeah yeah because they, they 
Had they, is this not because the, 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 because the Germans had destroyed Rangers in the semi-final and there's a belief that the crowd is full of Celtic fans? Now, whether or not that actually stands up, I don't know. But, but, but they, there does seem to be something, something in that. But, and he, but he, he really he talks about the magic of the night uh, that some of the, some of the most magnificent sporting artistry Hampden Park has ever seen. Um, the fans lingering for ages after the final whistle because you know you don't want to leave the magic. You want to you want to yeah. stay stay with uh, with with the magic. Uh, Scottish spectators settled to enjoy their national game as only foreigners can play it, which is a lovely quote to throw at the Scots when they start getting too big for themselves. Um, awestruck appreciation of the glories that have been paraded before them. It's one thing to see the wonders of Pushkas, Di Stefano, Hento, Vidal and the rest on a TV screen. It's another to see them on the, in, in the flesh, to yeah. hear their, their urgent shouts as they wreak precise devastation on an opposing defence. Last night, they flaunted all that has made them incomparable. It's fantastic stuff, written while written, it's happening. Really, that's the thing, isn't it? It's not, it's not an after the event, let's consider this and let's talk about how good these are. It's, it's someone watching it happen and thinking, Bloody hell, this is, and there's a lovely quote, I think it's Jimmy Greaves, it's certainly one of the England players from that era, I think it's Jimmy Greaves um, saying that he'd watched the game and he basically like, these guys play a different sport to us, so what, 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 am, I, what am I watching here? Um, and, and, and I think that there, there is, that sense of appreciation is, is, is very definitely there and I think that's obviously what, what feeds into the myth a little bit and feeds into the kind of the, the, the longevity of it and there's, there's a nice story that I believe it's Canadio tells the story of being back in Scotland at Hamden Park many years later, you know, best part of 30, 40 years later, and someone running over to him and saying, oh, I was there that night, which, of course, everyone claims to have been there that night, Alex Ferguson and God knows who else. Um, I, I, was the official attendance 137,000 or something? So I suppose there were a lot of people there. And, and Canadio telling the story, this guy runs over and says, I was there that night, I was a little boy, you influenced me forever. And Canadio saying, who are you? And he said, I'm the president of the Scottish Football Federation. And so, oh, well, uh, I suppose it did make a difference then, or, or, or perhaps not, I don't know. Okay, there is a slight homage to Catalonia uh, context as well that we have to address because um, you mentioned already Franco uh, being the great dictator, uh, the great survivor as a dictator as well for many more years to come, for at least another generation, wasn't it? And at this point, uh, the front pages of the newspapers on this day, and, uh, May the 18th, 1960, was a Wednesday, front page of The Guardian that I'm seeing here it is all about the sort of global politics of East and West, the Cold War politics and so on with uh, Khrushchev, uh, the Russian, uh, he wouldn't be president, would he? In those days, it was general secretary of the Communist Party of Russia, the head of uh, the nation or the Soviet Union at that point, sorry, forgive me, uh, was Nikita Khrushchev. And he's on the front page uh, with, you know, <laughs> <laughs> calling the shots with regards to East-West uh, diplomacy at that point. Western leaders blame Khrushchev's attitude. Still willing to talk, though, is the front page of uh, The Guardian. And Chinese pressure ineffective in Kremlin and the Pakistanis are pressuring the Russians. It's all about the Russians, all about, sorry, the Soviets, I should say. Um, where was Spain in all of this? Because it it didn't fit comfortably in the East or the West. And what I remember at this point, and I wasn't old enough to remember it, by the way, but what I remember from reading about at this point is that Spain, as you say, just before it became the sort of uh, tourist destination for Brits where we didn't drink the water famously because we didn't trust it, but they were a, a very um, introvert nation. They were looking in on themselves, weren't they? Or were they looking outwards as well? Right. Well, this is this is this takes us back a little bit to, to what we were talking about earlier about the significance of 1953 as as part of the opening up process. As I say, the Concordat with Rome is really really important because it gives legitimacy to the to the regime. I think what Real Madrid do uh, in these five European Cups gives some legitimacy to the regime, or at least to the country, some idea of of if you like um, modernity and joy and light and, and and you know this isn't necessarily an enclosed and 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 sort of isolated country in the way that it had been. The, you've got the the significant of the basis the significance of the basis agreement with the U.S. military in 1953 as well, and you get the base, uh, U.S. bases set up in Spain, which is part of bringing Spain back into the international fold. Because of course, what happens after after the end of the Second World War is that Mussolini and, and and Hitler are removed, and the one, if you like, fascist dictator in Europe remaining is Franco. So much Portugal. so. 
And Portugal, of course, yeah. And so much so that you have, although, of course, Portugal's relationship with Britain is different to, to, to Spain's because of the, the, the nature of that. And so, so much so that you have some within, um, even within the British government, but in particular, obviously, the British opposition, trying to impose upon the British government the idea that removal of Franco should be a, 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 an explicit stated war aim of the Second World War. Franco is not removed. Franco gets recognised by the UN, I think, in 1950. But recognition is still not the first step. And go back to what you were saying earlier, Tim, about, about Italy. Well, the Marshall Plan comes to Spain as well. You know, one of Spain's most famous films is, is, is this film, Bienvenido, Mr. Marshall. Welcome, Mr. Marshall. And about how that helps to project and to, and to, to if you like, kind of kickstart this economic development, which comes basically through acceptance with the West. And of course, what happens is you get to a point where the West thinks, well, if we're not going to get rid of this guy, we might as well have him on board. And one thing is true. And absolutely inescapable. Franco's anti-communist credentials are completely <laughs> irreproachable. You know, there's, and so you 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 effectively start to repackage him. And there's this phrase that's used about him. He becomes what what gets known as the Sentinel of the West. You know, this is the guy now that that was that always knew that the Soviet Union wasn't to be trusted. So you can repackage him, and rather than him being the last of the fascist pariahs, he becomes part of this. Um, you know, the if you like the realigning of Europe into a Cold War context rather than the Second, War, Second World War context. And so you, you do at this stage, you absolutely are in the stage now where this is opening up, where tourism is starting to happen. Not in the numbers yet that will really kickstart Spain in the mid to late 60s, but it's already happening. And it's happening, as I say, that's why I go back to 1953 as a key moment. 1953 is, is, is part of this process. And I think possibly the, the single most important year towards this process, because you get the basis agreement, because you get recognition from, from the Vatican, because you've already had UN recognition. And so this is starting to happen. So you see it, for example, in, in culture. You, you do, despite everything, you do get a swinging 60s in, the, in Spain. You do get a cultural explosion. You do get the Beatles. So to give you a, the, the but, most... But, but you don't get any nudity. And I'll tell you no, why you I don't. know that for a moment. I'll tell you that in a moment. Yeah, sorry, carry on. So, well, I mean, just to give you an example of this, the Real Madrid team that wins the European Cup in 1966, and by the way, this poses answers some of your other questions as well, wins the European Cup in 1966, six years later. By then, the entire team is Spanish. There's no foreigners left. Partly because Real Madrid have run out of money in 1960-61, which is another reason why this this falls away, partly because the, the, you know, this generation of players has gone. So Puskas has gone and Di Stefano has gone. Um, and you've got this team that's all Spaniards. That team is known as the Madrid of the Yeah, Yeah. And that is a very bad transliteration of Yeah, Yeah, Yeah from the Beatles song, She Loves You. And so, and so this is because it's seen as this idea that this is, this is going hand in hand with, with, with the arrival of the Beatles. There's a very famous photograph of, I think it's, well, I, I was about to say, I think it's five, but obviously it would make much more sense if it was four. But I still think it's five members of the Real Madrid team wearing Beatles wigs. Uh, and they look bloody ridiculous, by the way. They look like Wurzel Gummidge rather than the Beatles, but that's, that's by the by. Uh, one of them looks like Carlos Tevez. Tevez is, is quite extraordinary. Anyway, so they get this, this idea. They're, they're, the, they're the yeah, yeah team. Because they're the yeah, yeah, yeah team from, from that era. So you do get this social shift, even within a conservative and dictatorial context. You also get a shift in the Spanish constitution, even if it is only window dressing, you get the, 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 the pseudo democratic um, legitimization of Franco, which even allows some Franco apologies to say this is not a dictatorship anymore because you get, you get a kind of if you like a, what would you call it? A, a representative assembly of sorts, even though it's not a, not, not a democracy. So you, you have all of these processes happening that mean that, that you're absolutely right. You don't get the nudity you would like to have. You don't get some of the social own, own aperture that you would like to have, but you're getting some of that. And it is, it is starting to shift. And as I say, you get the abolishment, in particular, you get the abolishment of a policy of autarky, which of course was national self-sufficiency. And that gets broken. Why? Because what's driving Spain's recovery is US money, foreign money through tourism, and then also the departure of Spaniards to work abroad and and remittance money coming back into Spain, in particular Germany. Yeah. The reason why the reason why I I remember uh, that there was no nudity in uh, in Spain. Well, here comes a story. Will, you, yeah, will you try? Were you, were you trying to walk down the road wearing no clothes? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, that might not have been Spain. That might just have been you. <laughs> Well, there was no sex, please, we're British in yeah. these days. So I'm talking about the late 70s. As a 17-year-old, I worked 
in a theatre where they had this nude musical. This was the era of throw your clothes off for hair or, you know, whatever the musical might be. And um, the the nude musical, musical was one called um, Let My People Come. Oh. Yeah, work that one out for yourself. It was on at the Regent Theatre, which incidentally was the very first uh, venue to show what was then sort of moving pictures, uh, first cinema in the UK in about 1899 or something like that. It's now part of the University of Westminster's campus. It always was, but they've reappropriated it. Reappropriated it. The University of Westminster in those days was called Poly Polytechnic of Central London. Anyway, late 70s, I'm working at this theatre. Biggest group of clients were uh, busloads of people coming from Spain. <laughs> it was a load of shit. The production was a load of shit. But they just wanted to see because they couldn't quite believe what you know what people nude on yeah. stage and sometimes they would come without having booked tickets after the performance had started and um you know they'll beg us you know can you not get us in anyway and i didn't realize what the scam that was going on a couple of the other ushers i, I stumbled upon it by chance so they had to include me in on the scam but basically they were just basically um t you know saying to the uh spanish oh okay we'll try and get you in but you know here are your tickets so they've given the sort of like the stubs of the other tickets. And it's also, yeah, it's going to cost you double, basically. <laughs> and, and, and the Spanish would come and pay, pay whatever just to see and, a bit of nudity on stage. Yeah. Did they come? I hope not, because, you know, on an usher's wage, you're having to clear that up. You yeah, know, that's not... It's really not worth it, is it? <laughs> no. As the song said, Dear Mum and Dad, how could I tell you? I never, ever thought I'd have the nerve If I didn't think so much of you I guess I would have just let it be You'd have heard it from somebody somewhere But that wouldn't be so fair Maybe one day it won't be such a hard thing to say I'm gay, I'm gay <laughs> So there was all sorts of nudity on the stage is the point I was trying to get to. Something that was happening two days before this game. Parliament <laughs> had a second reading of a bill to curb teddy boys. Really? Wow. Oh, yeah. I didn't know that. And, and something else, very, very emblematic of the times, May 1960, the Cavern Club relaxes its jazz-only policy. Tectonic plates are moving in England. Wow, there well. we go. Yeah. Yeah, um... Uh, the Teddy Boy bit, uh, I don't know if you know this Teddy, Teddy Boy Calypso, I can't remember who it's by, Teddy Boy Calypso, it's well worth having a listen to, Teddy Boy Calypso, where he's basically the Calypsonian from the Caribbean, because remember, Teddy Boys and uh, people from the Caribbean didn't always see eye to eye, uh, the new immigrants coming over Windrush, post Windrush and so on, so Teddy Boy Calypso urges the government to, to birch the Teddy Boys. <laughs> <It's Wow. laughs> <laughs> anyway, the uh, day after, Thursday, May the 19th, this was the report in the Guardian of the match. Real Madrid once more showed their omnipotence, Pushka's undoubted master of the arts. Real Madrid, Madrid won their fifth successive European Cup final last night by beating Eintracht Frankfurt 7-3 at Hamden Park in the later stages of the Spanish uh, sides. Artistry was so immensely superior that its players gave the appearance of putting on an exhibition. Even Eintracht cannot really feel too badly about being defeated by such masters. I think that sums it up quite accurately. But what it says is that Pushkas is the star of mm. the show, Sid. Yeah, I like, I, I like the fact that, I mean, by the way, his goal scoring record, I, I, I made a note of this. He played 39 times in the European Cup and scored 35 goals. And this is a guy who turned up, at Real, turned up at Real Madrid old and fat and slow and couldn't do it anymore. And, and I remember talking to the son of Zoltan Sibor, who was one of the Hungarians playing at Barcelona, and him saying, you lot in the West of Europe don't realise how good this guy was. Because you think he's good, but you saw him when he was rubbish. You know, you saw him when he was no longer the player he once was. And one of these goals is quite similar to the one, the famous one he scores at Wembley, in terms of how hard it's hit and high and at the near post yeah. and straight yeah. to the top of the net. And it's he, the one right on half time. That's the one just before half time, where he's incredibly quick to the ball, actually. He gets to the ball quicker than anyone else yeah. and just absolutely levers it. And, and you, you know, you talk to, to people about him and they would say that he used to have in his garden these kind of rings hanging down from a post and he would literally just have 10 balls in a row and run on the line and boom, 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 boom. And every single one of them would hit his target. 
every. I, I think that the reason that the Guardian have picked him out is because the English audience knew him as a result of Fifty Three. They knew him Quite much probably. better than, than they knew yeah. Di Stefano. So he, he's the bigger name yeah. for the audience that they're talking to. And that allows a little bit of ownership, I suppose, as well. That you know, you you kind of this is the guy that we discovered at Wembley, and so therefore we there's a and I, I, although I think that's at some subconscious level, I think there's an element of that of, of you know this is this is what the one you remember. Like for example, in England, the way that everyone always talks about Pushkas as the, the the galloping major, no one in Spain ever calls him that. And you see, you know, if you try and project this as his nickname in Spain, no one will know who you're talking about. But of course, that's 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 an English. Uh, a, a, an English construction. Uh, my my favourite line on him was uh, was Amado. You say that you know that he used to play football pregnant. That's how big and how fat he was. But it didn't matter because he was so good with the ball. I love Pushkas because he had one of those Dixie Dean uh, yeah. head partings. You know, just off <laughs> off left off the centre or whatever. And he was always uh, sharp. You know, he looked very sharp on the ball, but off the ball as well. Yeah, see, but the Stefano couldn't do any of that, could he? Because th this is almost enough well, to make me. He was bored at this point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> see, this is almost enough to make me religious. You know, the, the way that 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 uh, Zidane has so much unbelievable talent and elegance. But in compensation, he would sweat more than anyone else yeah. had ever sweated in a football shirt. And his shirt would be a different colour from his teammates because he just he'd sweated so much. Yeah. And in the same way, Di Stefano is this wonderful, elegant, commanding figure. And he's bald. You know, it, it, maybe it's, it's a way that the almighty has just levelled the playing field there's, a little bit. Yeah. There's, a brilliant, there's a brilliant quote from one of the papers at the time. And, and to be fair, I don't think it was as early as this. I think it's a couple of years later. But Di Stefano's nickname, and I'm sure a lot of people will know this, was Blonde Arrow. Uh, because you know he he had been blonde and he was and he was incredibly fast. And there's this newspaper comment and it's talking about his decline. As I, say, I think it's a couple of years after this final. And it says that the problem is he's not he's no longer either blonde or an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> it happens to us all. It happens to us all. Listen, Sid, you've you've totally understood the context of this podcast. You know, we we look at the iconic game. We try and uh, talk about the social context that that uh, game was in, social and political context, which we've covered, I think, very clearly. You've given us an insight mm. into Spain at and the how. time of Franco. Really appreciate that. There's one thing left out of the, um, the conceit, if you like, of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast, which is the soundtrack yeah. at the time. So the soundtrack... Uh, of 18th of May 1960. So it, it, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, it was well, for and me. It, it's, again, it, well, it's a moment when the tectonic plates, I think, are shifting. Of course, you're right. You're absolutely right. Do you want to explain what the tectonic well, plate is? Well, maybe we'll, we're going to disagree here, and that's fine. No, rock and roll to pop is the tectonic shift. Yeah, isn't it? yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, I'm, the, the Elvis one that's in here um, stuck, stuck on Stuck on you. It, it, He's kind of already reached self-parody, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's 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 not the real. It's not, you've got Elvis um, at the wrong time here. He's, yeah, he's, and, here's, here's me thinking that the tectonic shift was my old man's a dustbin, a dustman. Oh, my, number ten oh, with Laurie well, we'll No, get to that. I don't oh. think that's the tectonic. That's always been there. That's always been there. Yeah, this that's is what is I mean. Is I, I, I saw that and I thought this is not what I anticipated in a top ten as we enter into the sixties. That ain't. As bad as Max Bygrave's version of Beans. things ain't what they used to be. But I think, so I, I think what, what we're seeing is the, the rock and roll, the American rock and roll, has lost its original, its, its head of steam, hasn't it? Buddy's gone and, and, and some of what's coming on is quite nice. And I, I love the Everly Brothers. And I think that this is Kathy's Clown is that for me it's their finest hour i think it's great that you know, the, the way that it's country kind of song. You know blends that, with pop that is the kind of song that george michael would have written you know it's exactly yeah. the kind of song he would have written and gotten away with and everybody's do a masterly job of it but when you say buddy's gone you're right but his uh imitators are still in the charts uh, lead of which is adam faith for example adam, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 someone uh, else's see, the, the english stuff it hasn't quite found its feet yet, has it? Adam Faith is a is a is a third rate Buddy Holly imitation. Anthony Newley, who's great, and he's just everywhere at this time. He's doing films, he's doing television. He's he's, he's a really interesting, but his best stuff, I think, is the novelty stuff, not the straight stuff that he's he's here with the uh, in number two with with Do You Mind? Um, but there are signs, and I'll tell you what I think the signs are. And I couldn't believe this when I saw this. Gentlemen, 
Marv Johnson has two records in the charts. Marv Johnson has two records in the charts. He's got, you got what it takes. Uh, and uh, um, I, I love the way you love. Now, this is what the Beatles are listening to. You know, this is, this is, I was amazed to see this because I've always associated the mass breakout of Motown in England have been, has been in 65. To find out that Marv Johnson had two records in the charts in, in May of 1960 amazed me. And that's what the next generation are, are listening to. You know, that, that's when English music is going to find its feet, when it stops imitating Buddy Holly, third-rate kind of pop imitations, and starts using Marv Johnson first to copy it and then to take it off in, in, into other directions. And Jimmy Jones as well, handyman. There's a little bit of Sam Cooke in there. There's, 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 a, there's a little bit of falsetto. There's, there, there's a real talent. And it, it, uh, I think he's probably more famous for, for good timing than he, Jimmy Jones. But you can see there's a young English generation are going to be latching on to R&B. This has and a, in a- this time, which is all about, as you said, the transition from rock and roll to pop, the next wave is, is already there, which is, which is R&B. What I was going to say is in Spain, obviously, you get, you get this process happening slightly differently. We've already talked about you know, the arrival of, of the Beatles or the being of the arrival of the Beatles, which comes a little bit later. But what the, the Spanish number one at the time, and, and I'm, obviously I'm not going to claim to have known this, so I looked it up, is, is a song called Estremecete by Los Yopes, which is a, a four-man group from Cuba. Now, so far, so standard. But then I put this on, and I didn't know this. It's basically all shook up, translated into Spanish. And it's, it's this kind of bizarre sort of Latinization of rock to, and I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn here because I don't obviously understand the process of, of, of how music is starting to, to come into Spain. But it's almost as if it's, let's make this acceptable to Spain by, by Spanishifying it or by Hispanifying it anyway. And so you've got this sort of slightly weird Latino-Cuban sound version of a song which is basically all shook up and so you kind of go oh maybe this is the beginning exactly as you say the beginning of, of a shift into something sort of more rocky yeah I, I i agree with both of you actually and it's really interesting to look at Where's it from the, the fun spanish in that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> well the, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the fun i'm coming to the fun don't worry you know with me there's always some fun tim it's going to get there um it's really interesting to hear from the spanish perspective because of course American rock and roll has dominated the entire European landscape at this point. You know, what you were saying for rock and roll to have penetrated or pop music later on to have penetrated into what is essentially an authoritarian regime. Yeah. You know, remember, they were the counterculturists of the time, the Beatles. So the idea that uh, General Franco allowed people to have long hair always you know will always amuse me because i would have thought spanish oh, people well, while we're on the long hair can i quickly give a shout out to the fact that this chart has the real the proper the genuine stairway to heaven oh. i just noticed that and i i must admit it's not a stairway to heaven i know is it the same song I assume it's not. It's not the same song. No, but what I mean is, can it, you imagine it, Neil Sedaka? What, what I mean, but what I mean by that is, is it's not a song that gives way to to a separate no. version. It's entirely unrelated, right? Yeah, yeah. It's Neil Sedaka. Okay. okay. Uh, he, he was joking. He was having a laugh there. <laughs> what I would say is, the Beatles are listening to a lot of music at this point, given that they're they've just gone to where uh, all. Yeah, or they're just about to go to where um, Elvis Presley has just come from, which is Germany at the yeah, time. They haven't gone yet. They're, they're yeah, doing no, they auditions as the, yeah, sil- the, the Silver Beatles. <laughs> okay, thank you for the accent. Elvis Presley at this point, going back to him very quickly, we shouldn't disrespect the guy that started this whole thing. Um, he unfortunately had to spend two years doing his military service in Germany from 58 to 60. So at this point, he's Could lost he have gone the- on the land. He could have, yeah, he could have, but you know, Elvis, he's a good old American boy, apple pie and all of that, uh, when of course he wasn't eating uh, squirrel burgers <laughs> when he was really, really broke. Uh, he had a penchant for them as a kid. Um, but at this point, so he's done two years in Germany. They quickly recorded quite a few tracks before he went to Germany. Uh, and they were of this because at that point, 58, rock and roll has actually started shifting before Body Holly. Because if you think about it, 
Buddy Holly had gone to New York to do things like It Doesn't Matter Anymore. So he had yeah. moved away from the rock and roll. There's, there's a it's the Perry of, Como era, isn't it? Yeah, oh, I'd hate to call it that. Um, but yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. There is a clip of Buddy Holly in 1957, I think it is. So that will be the day has gone number one all over the world. And, you know, they're talking to Buddy Holly and he's sitting on a bed or something like this. And the guy says to him, how long do you think this rock and roll thing will last? He says, well, probably about till the end of the summer, I reckon. <laughs> he he is shifting away from it and has taken out the, the rawness of rock and roll. And a lot of this chart represents mm-hmm. that. I don't think the Beatles aren't listening to any of this because this is the bridge between rock and roll and what the Beatles were to do later on. A lot of it has got um, already got Motown or if you like uh, late R&B or early soul influences uh, to it. A a, a lot of it's coming straight out of um, a lot of the shift in America in particular. Marv Johnson does sound like Sam Cooke at this point, for example. So the Beatles are listening to all of these influences coming through. The problem is that this era of the kind of preppy rock and roll that started in 1958, it's still there in 1960, two years later. You haven't had the earthquake you know never mind the tectonic shifts it's the earthquake that we need uh to bring a definitive end to this era so you see you you think someone's got to shoot a president someone like that you think that i think so yeah i think that it's a good book yeah that might do it (laughs) it might might force everybody to look at themselves and think what what the hell is the shit that we've been putting out over these last years (laughs) i think that's a good way of putting it tim i I never thought of it if, if only the music could be better there might yeah. not, there but, might not be way, the future on that grass, you know. <laughs> by the way, given that we're in a, some of a dull drums musically at the moment, I wouldn't advise this at home, kids. <laughs> no, Let me no. just make that very clear. But uh, you yeah, not? I mean... it's lasted a little bit too long. And Cliff Richard was one of those early uh, UK artists that realised that rock and roll wasn't going to last Uh, very long and he took his lead from Buddy Holly and started shifting to all this cabaret stuff, Fall in Love With You and all this stuff that's at number eight in the chart. Dwayne Eddy. Yeah, yeah. Dwayne Eddy 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 is one of the good things in this. Yeah, no, it's one of the great things. You introduced me to him live on air and I had the pleasure of of saying something I don't think he'd ever heard. I don't think he'd ever heard anyone say this to him before. I said Twang that thing and he'd heard that. (laughs) But I then said, Dwayne, Spank that plank. I don't think you'd ever heard that one. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I like. He's a, but if you listen to Dwayne Eddy here, he's not the Dwayne Eddy of 1958 or 57. This is Dwayne Eddy playing film music because mm-hmm. they started using his twang for all those sort of like spaghetti yeah. western kind of movies. It's like the John Barry Seven. They've got an instrumental as well. It's, exactly. it's, it's kind of film music. Exactly. But there are some classic songs. Um, and Sid, so have you... If you do you want to point out any classic songs that you like in this, um, I'll give you an example. Cradle of Love by Johnny Preston. What a great song that still mm-hmm. has um, a lot of resonance today, I think. Uh, let's leave aside Delaware by Perry Como. <laughs> dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, because that was always supposed to be a joke yeah. record. But Country Boy by Fats Domino is a mm-hmm. really deep soulful blues tune that he's getting into there you know yeah that's probably that's probably the one that most stands out to me of these of in, in terms in terms of a sound that that feels recognizable that feels important that feels significant but as you say you go for you can go through this list and see actually a lot of songs that kind of don't really register very much that don't really feel like they're changing anything or or, or, or having a huge impact uh, that that may well be the one. As I say, I must admit, the one that really jumped out at me was just seeing my old man's a dustman on there. I'm thinking, fucking hell, were we still doing this? <laughs> Even this, well, this well, time. we were still doing it. I mean, for uh, a long when, time after that. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, we were still doing it. When I was growing up in Tottenham, in North London, I remember singing, my old man's a dustman. He was, and my old man actually literally giving me a clip around the ear hole and saying, how mm-hmm. dare you? Mm-hmm. I came over to this country to study. I'm a scientist, and you're going around saying I'm a dustman. <laughs> but next thing, next thing you say, you'll, you'll be saying you weren't halfway up the goalpost of your knickers around your neck. I mean, it's just <laughs> 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 but it, it's, it's music hall, isn't it? And, and well, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, but I mean, but, I, uh, I didn't uh, expect to see it actually in the charts. If you see what I mean, you see it almost as a 
as a, as a kind of a manifestation, as you say, of going home and singing it and chanting it as a as a kind of a popular culture ditty rather than a rather than something that's actually being bought by people. At least this late, anyway. May I give a big shout out to who the recently at this point departed Eddie Cochran though. He's in the charts posthumously with uh, Three Steps to Heaven. So this match takes place just shortly after he died in this car crash where <clears throat> Gene Vincent survived. His girlfriend, uh, what's her name? Sharon Seeley, I think it was, who was a songwriter, survived. And he was the only um, casualty or fatality, rather. And uh, Dave D of Dave D, Dozy Beaky, Mick and Titch, who was a cop at that time, was the first policeman on the wow. scene. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Know, that's that's true. Um, but Buddy Holly, uh, Buddy Holly and Eddie Cochran knew each other. So when Buddy Holly had died the year before, Buddy Holly was so taken emotionally, he had written a song called Three Stars. It's something of a sugary, sweet song about, you know, I see three stars up in heaven. One of them is mm. the Big Bopper. The other is a 17-year-old kid called Richie Valens and Buddy. And it really is a sentimental track. But he recorded this song, Three Steps to Heaven, which was his only number one in the UK, even though he'd uh, given us uh, Sometime Blues and uh, Come On Everybody, <clears throat> which were much better tracks. But Three Steps to Heaven is, I think, the way rock and roll was heading uh, for both Buddy Holly and for Eddie Cochran as well. You could see them getting very soulful in their rock and roll. Three Steps to Heaven is actually a very good pop ditty, if you like, if you take the fact that he's just died out of it. It does get to number one. It's at number 32 at the moment. In this chart, he eventually gets to number one. If you take the fact that he has died out of it and you can separate yourself from that, it's one of the great pop ditties, actually. Now there are three steps to heaven. Just listen and you will plainly see. And as I travel on and think Things do go on, just follow steps one, two, and three. A Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent, which one's your DiStefano and which one's your Puskas? That's a very good question. On reflection, um, it would have to be Eddie Cochran as the DiStefano because his body of work um, is, um, I think, stands on its own. Gene Vincent, he had his moment. And for me, when I was younger, you know, I couldn't get enough of Gene Vincent. I could sing every Gene Vincent song from his period at Capitol Records. We'll, we'll, we'll take that as red. You don't have to. No, 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 no. You're not going to take it as red. I will too. <laughs> well, as I was walking down the street, I saw this crazy sound with a crazy beat. All them cats are going real wild. And all them cats just jumping in the other way. Be a big about Bobo. Band starts grooving. Go, go. You love me. I love you. Be a big about Bobo. And not to talk of Blue Jean Baby and, of course, the Bebop Alula. Once he did that, that was his big, 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 big tune. Bebop Alula was the one. Arguably, um, Eddie Cochran had a lot more, but his big tunes, two massive tunes, uh, Summertime Blues and Come On Everybody. But if you look at his body of work, if you get a double album of... Um, uh, Eddie Cochran, you'll see that oh, he was absolutely tremendous. Uh, he did a uh, cover of Ray Charles's Alleluia, I Love Her So, which I think actually is better than Ray Charles's Alleluia, I Love Her So. He's got an amazing track called I'm Having a Nervous Breakdown. And the beat, because he took his bass straight from um, Bo Diddley, you know. You, you hear the bass on a lot of the mm -hmm. tracks uh, by Eddie Cochran is doom, 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 doom. I'm having a nervous breakdown. Doom, 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 doom. And he also covered a lot of different genres. Um, Buddy Holly didn't cover a lot of genres until later on in his life. And actually, in a, I'm not being unkind, but if Buddy Holly, if, if sorry, Gene Vincent, sorry. If Gene F Vincent had died in that car crash um, and his career had ended at that point, it would probably been better remembered, but he went on to record a lot of complete tosh. I remember getting an album of his. Staying was Alive was a bad career decision. 
It was actually. Yeah. He had an album called If Only You Could See Me Today. I listened to it, you know, a couple of years back because I thought, was it as bad as I remember it? It was worse. Mm. Yeah. You know so. what you two have done today? Both of you two, you've managed to give me a nostalgia for an era that I didn't even live live through. Well, neither did I. Or did I? No, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I exactly. was born at this point, I admit. I'm the only one here <laughs> listening who was actually born at <laughs> this point. But I was only a baby. Give me a, give me a break. <laughs> Puppy Love by Paul Anka. That made a comeback by the time you were old enough to remember. Indeed, yeah. Donny yeah. Osmond. Donny Osmond, yeah. But that was Paul Anka, one of the great songwriters there. Emil Ford and the Checkmates at number 38 with uh, On a Slow Boat to China as well. Another great thing. Edith Piaf. At number 41, this is a great wow. chance, you know, this yeah. is a great chance. Um, it was diverse, but like you say, it's just about, everything's just about to change for the better, and thankfully, because I think we've come to the end of this era. Although I think it manages to survive for another two years. Or is it three years before that president gets shot? Yeah, yeah. 